and, uh, and also uh, the other side of me is the side of me which I am more fascinated by myself uh, now, which is that of being an animal advocate. And um, I've been uh, sharing my life with a huge amount of animals for about 35 years. And uh, I'm attached to an enormous amount of charities. Uh, I think I became known a couple of years ago as the man who can't say no. <laughs> and uh, I'm delighted to be attached to all the charities that I am committed to. It's, uh, it pleases my, pleases my head and it pleases my heart enormously. Um, it was uh, my involvement with animals over the years is why I became about 10 years ago an ethical vegan. Um, I couldn't quite separate uh, my, my love of animals and then eat. So I am delighted to be uh, an ethical vegan and uh, I'm delighted to be here this evening. So if I could, I'll just give you a quick summary about this wonderful book. Um, here's a quote from Professor Mark Burkhoff, who is an amazing man. A new book about numerous aspects of animal welfare merits worldwide attention, which of course it does. Combining the expertise of 50 authors, many of whom are world leaders in their fields, and edited by the University of Winchester Center for Animal Welfare, Professor Andrew Knight and Paula Sparks, the Routledge Handbook of Animal Welfare, comprehensively covers animal welfare concerns associated with the farming of terrestrial species and fish, transportation, slaughter, the use of animals in laboratories, zoos, entertainment, and as companions, working animals, and more. Virtually all contemporary animal welfare issues are covered in great depth. The inclusion of recent topics such as the impacts of climate change on animal welfare and the links between animal exploitation, antimicrobial resistance, and pandemics ensure the text is among the most current in its field. This textbook also covers, uh, also includes coverage of animal ethics, animal law in key regions of the world, stakeholder perspectives, education, communication, and human behavioral change. It will become a central reading for policymakers, researchers, and other professionals working in the animal welfare sector and for students of animal welfare everywhere. And now I'd like to introduce uh, our first speaker, Andrew Knight. Andrew has been trying to improve the welfare of animals for most of his adult life and has waged high profile campaigns for animal protection, sometimes attracting considerable controversy. He was also a cat and dog veterinarian for many years before being recruited to teach at one of the world's largest veterinary schools in the, Car in the Car Caribbean. In 2015, he established the Center for Animal Welfare at the University of Winchester where he is Professor of Animal Welfare and Ethics. He's also a veterinary specialist in animal welfare, accredited in the UK, Europe, the US, and New Zealand. He has a large number of academic and popular publications, social media videos, and several websites on animal welfare issues. He regularly works with animal welfare charities to advocate for animals, and is frequently interviewed by the media. He's received over 20 awards and research grants for this work, and is the lead editor of the Routledge Handbook of Animal Welfare. I should also point out, just before he comes up, he's sitting here, which would be a great pleasure to bring up. He also stood for Parliament against uh, Theresa May about four years ago. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter. And I'm I want to apologise to everybody firstly for, for not uh, winning that election. <laughs> <laughs> and of course we would have been in a very different place uh, had I done so. I'd also <laughs> like to acknowledge um, Professor Clive uh, Phillips as well, who is our, uh, the other one of our three uh, co-editors of this new textbook on animal welfare. And um, some of the text uh, from there came from the University of Winchester media release, so that's why I focused on the Winchester faculty that were the, um, the co-editors of the, this book. But, uh, Clive's contribution was also absolutely essential. Uh, when I was first asked by Routledge to produce a new textbook on animal welfare, I had two sort of immediate thoughts. The first thought that came to mind was, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> this, this was a crazy idea. I had no time whatsoever. I was a very busy academic, uh, 
running uh, my master's program, our Sarah Family Welfare, and all the research that I was involved in, and it would be mad to take on a project of this kind of scope and depth. Um, so absolutely uh, not at all. And around about two seconds after that thought, the second thought came, and that thought was that this was actually too good an opportunity to refuse. Um, it was an opportunity to produce a, a new textbook on animal welfare that covered all the contemporary animal welfare issues of concern, the farming of animals and all, all the major farm, farming systems, the land animals, farming of fish, transportation, slaughter, uh, euthanasia, other forms of animal killing, the use of animals in laboratories, zoos, wild animals, companion animals and more. It was also a chance, uh, as well as producing a fully up-to-date textbook covering all those issues, it was a chance to also include key new and emerging issues such as climate change uh, and animal welfare, and the contributions of practices such as intensive farming and the wildlife trade to antimicrobial resistance and pandemics. Secondly, there were numerous books about animal welfare that have been published over the last 15 or so years. However, I felt that most of them were either insufficiently based on scientific evidence, which weakened their uh, credibility, or else those, typically with a strong scientific basis, seem quite often to fall short of seriously critiquing animal use practices. The calls for abolition or wholesale reform uh, usually seem to be lacking, even when well justified by the scientific evidence. I thought that here was an opportunity to produce a textbook that had the courage to make those calls when warranted by the evidence and to be underpinned by a very strong scientific evidence base ensuring that its conclusions were robust and would be taken seriously by stakeholders in government, in industry and in academia. By achieving these objectives, this new textbook, I thought, could become a key resource for animal welfare campaigners and animal advocates globally. And we wanted to also include, to help those people, key related topics. So uh, around about a third of the textbook is dedicated to animal ethics, coverage of animal law in major regions of the world, uh, and topics such as uh, different stakeholder perspectives, communication and education about animal welfare, and also the key topic of human behavioural change. And so I went back to Routledge and I said, I felt there was great potential for a textbook in this area that would make a real contribution to advancing this field. But unfortunately I had no time to actually do this. But they had this brilliant idea. That's when they said, said well, how about you recruit a couple of willing co-editors? And that's when um, I was incredibly fortunate to be able to rope in uh, professors uh, Clive Phillips and Paula Sparks. And I could not have wished for two more knowledgeable people in terms of the depth of um, their detailed knowledge of the issues and also the breadth of the issues that they covered, as well as uh, professional, hardworking and reliable colleagues. Uh, Professor Sparks, as well as uh, managing the entire section on uh, animal law and uh, other related sections of the textbook, uh, at the same time uh, ran the UK Centre for Animal Law and also organised one of the world's biggest conferences on animal law in recent years and that conference uh, recently occurred whilst also doing his textbook. Professor Clive Phillips uh, held a variety of uh, leadership positions on uh, key governmental bodies, uh, prof professorial positions uh, at, in, in Australia and internationally whilst also managing this textbook, also managing quite a busy travel schedule. At one point, uh, it seemed to require him to stumble out of his caravan in the middle of the Australian outback because he was on a sheep station at the time, at night, uh, in his pyjamas, with his slightly unimpressed wife looking on somewhere in the background, uh, with the starry Australian skies above his head, to take a Zoom call with me in the United Kingdom in daytime to discuss the book. Such was Clive's dedication to this book. <laughs> so, a more dedicated and professional and knowledgeable and expert pair of co-editors I could not have wished for. Our first task was to go ahead and recruit uh, authors to actually write uh, what ended up being 36 chapters covering all the animal welfare issues, uh, animal law in key regions of the world and other key related topics. We managed in the end to recruit 50 um, uh, authors of the 36 chapters, some with more than one author, uh, from around the world, many of whom were actually world leaders in their field. So that was really fantastic. But the problem, unfortunately, with recruiting people who are world leaders in their fields is that they're also intensely busy. And it's incredibly difficult to actually ask them to take on a project like this. And when I stepped back, I realised that 
In fact, none of us really had any time to be doing this. None of us as co-editors, none of our authors. This was all just completely mad, frankly. Now, Rutledge had given us two years to do this. So I thought, okay, the solution, obviously, is that we're not going to take two years. None of us can afford to be doing this. We're going to knock it off in one year. So I said to all our, our authors, okay, well, we said to our authors, you've got six months. And magnificently, our authors generally rose to the challenge and managed to produce these wonderful, detailed, uh, fully up-to-date chapters uh, in six months. In a few cases, we had authors taking a little bit longer, add a few months for the production process, and voila, here we now are. About a year ahead of schedule, actually, with this incredible new textbook on animal welfare that hopefully will be a key resource uh, for animal welfare campaigners, animal advocates, uh, students and scholars of animal welfare industry uh, around the world. I'm really grateful to Routledge uh, for uh, putting me under all that pressure, no, for, for, for giving me the <laughs> opportunity to produce uh, this wonderful new textbook and to market it through their worldwide distribution so I can get to all these people that will make such good use of it. I'm incredibly grateful to my uh, co-editors and all the chapter authors, some of who are here today, without which this would have been uh, completely impossible to produce and certainly in this time frame. And I'm also really grateful actually to people like all of you. Without people like you who are interested in animal welfare and are interested in uh, improving uh, conditions for animals, publishers like Routledge wouldn't have any interest in producing books like this. So it's extremely important that um, people like you are here and are showing this kind of uh, enthusiasm. I'm very grateful to Confer and Karnak Publishing uh, for the use of their wonderful bookstore here this evening, this lovely venue that we're enjoying. Uh, I hope that after these talks are over, you'll continue to enjoy it with us out, out in the front uh, as we continue to mingle and enjoy the lovely um, uh, drinks and, and so on. Now, because we are academics, uh, professional full-time academics, we have academic uh, uh, timelines and academic budgets, meaning that we, we have no time and we have virtually no money, so we also haven't had time or money to organise any photographers. So if anyone does take any uh, particularly good photos that they feel they would be happy for us to use potentially for publicity about them from anywhere this evening, I'd be really grateful if you could maybe look me up on the internet. I'm really easy to find, Andrew Knight there, and just send them through. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, very much. And I, I hope if you get time in about a year and a half to take a bit of a sabbatical, you'll be standing inside the Rishi Sunak or his trust. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, Professor Clive Phillips. Clive Phillips was Australia's first professor of animal welfare at the University of Queensland and foundation director of the Centre for Animal Welfare and Ethics. He previously lectured at the universities of Cambridge and Wales. He has authored about 400 scientific journal articles on the welfare of farm, zoo, and companion animals. Animal nutrition, transport, and production. His books include Principles of Cattle Production, The Animal Trade, and The Welfare of Animals, The Silent Majority. Clive chairs the Queensland and Western Australian government's animal welfare boards, is editor-in-chief of the journal Animals, and Springer's Animal Welfare. There are we, there we are, sir. Thank you. Well, there I was, sitting in the desert, and he was trying to uh, instruct me how to um, upload some articles into the Google repository, and kept um, the signal kept being lost every few minutes, and eventually I realised it was just when the satellite was going over, I'd pick up the signal again. Um, we got there in the end, but uh, uh, he was very long-suffering. We got there. Um, Yes, yeah, so I was responsible for organising the chapters on farm animals and for me this is a particularly vital sector of our interactions with animals. Um, it's got a huge and growing number of animals that is one of the main reasons. The number of chickens worldwide has increased from 14 to 25 billion animals just over the last 25 years. So an enormous increase and that is about 10% of all the birds which exist worldwide, um, there are various estimates, but and, and that's a conservative estimate. But the other reason why I was keen to take on the farm animals is because there is so much cruelty on farms, widespread cruelty on many, and, and one could probably say most 
animal farms. We all know animals are crammed into small spaces, they have relatively little comfort, um, and they have to endure their bodies being mutilated just so that they can uh, fit into the systems that we have for them to grow and grow fast enough to satisfy our growing appetite for eating them. And this does have major effects on their welfare. Um, the farm animal production process has become, over the last quarter century or so, dominated by big industry. We all know that. Um, and their primary responsibility is either to their owners and their shareholders. Indeed, when I was on the cattle farm, uh, it was actually in the north of Australia, um, my daughter and her partner, they run that farm. It's 20,000 cattle uh, running on a farm, call it a station, the size of Worcestershire. So it's a massive organization and it's funded by a Chinese businessman. Um, they, they pipe water out into the desert so the cattle have got something to drink. Uh, they put roads in so they can get the cattle out and then they ship them to China. That's the sort of uh, development that the industry has taken over the last uh, uh, few decades. I've also been in cattle farms in China which have 30,000 animals in them. You know, these are massive operations. And in those operations, um, the industry that are running them, they're forced by international competition to develop systems of production that have greater and greater output from fewer and fewer resources. Less space for the animals, less food, and less comfort for them. Whereas the norm for the number of animals in these production units was just a few hundred, a quarter of a century ago, um, it may not now be numbered in tens of thousands. As well, the animal's genetics are manipulated to increase growth rates and milk yields to levels that are way beyond that for which nature designed the animals. The end result is that, cat that cows will only last two or three years in a dairy herd when their natural lifespan will be about 25 years. Chickens are grown to slaughter weight in just around six weeks and pigs are killed to make bacon at about six months of age. So all farm animals die prematurely, but for many it ends a life of pain and misery. When the animals for meat are ready for slaughter, we transport them often long distances in crowded conditions, a process which is known to cause significant stress. The slaughter process may also make their final hours painful and stressful, because not all animals are stunned before their final end. For some animals, such as poultry, the whole post-farm process may only last a few hours, but for others, such as the sheep traveling from Australia to the Middle East, it will be many weeks. Now fortunately, there are scientists around the world that are dedicated to understanding how these processes affect the farm animals. Most, um, but unfortunately not all, are given to an impartial assessment of their welfare. It's not easy. The evidence has to be carefully analyzed from the animal's behavior, physiology, gene expression, the animal's longevity and their disease status. And the contributors for the farm animal sector for this book were very carefully chosen for the extent of their experience and their integrity in reporting scientific results. Some of you are even here. We have Don Broom in the front uh, from Cambridge who contributed one of the chapters to my sector. So hopefully you can read the book yourself and decide if it is an acceptable way for humanity to treat the farm animals on our planet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's fascinating. In fact, when I was first introduced to the devastation of animal agriculture at its intensive level, um, I decided that on the, the very day that I experienced that to never eat meat again. And I've never regretted it. Paula Sparks is a visiting professor at the University of Winchester, UK, where she teaches animal law. She practiced as a barrister at Doughty Street Chambers in London before leaving the bar in 2018 to pursue a full-time role with the UK Centre of Animal Law, A-Law, a charity whose vision is a world where animals are fully protected by law. Paula frequently lectures and writes about animal-related law and policy. What a good idea that is, Paula.
together because um, the only way to actually uh, change what's happening um, in the animal world and indeed our planet is by addressing it from all of these different areas um, and I'm so delighted that we can do that and this book is fantastic as far as that's concerned. If I could just do a quick name check for someone who is also um, very inspiring, a man um, who has written the most fantastic book. Um, I'm not pushing that tonight, but I, 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 I would just like to mention it. It's a book called Sixty Harvests Left, and it's mm. the amazing Philip Bimbrey. <laughs> um, alongside this book, buy this book tonight. <laughs> <laughs> buy Sixty Harvests Tomorrow, but it's just an absolutely <laughs> sensational read. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce a very, very good friend of mine who I do an awful lot of campaigning with. We've been working together, I think, for certainly over 10 years. Um, we managed to man manacle him and drag him away from Brighton Beach today. His name is Dr. Mark Abraham, or Mark the Vet, as he's often known. He's a multi-award winning veterinary surgeon, author, broadcaster, and campaigns extensively for animal welfare issues in the UK, Europe, and the US. He is secretariat and co-founder of the all-party parliamentary dog advisory welfare group, APDORG, in Westminster, I'm the patron. <laughs> and in June 2019, after a 10-year campaign led by Mark, the UK government passed mm. Lucy's Law, mm. banning third-party commercial puppy and kitten dealers, making all dog and cat breeders accountable. Based in Brighton, Mark regularly visits local schools, chatting with pupils about caring for animals and each other. Mark's latest book, Be More Mosquito, <laughs> How You Can Campaign and Create Change, describes all the tools accessible to everyone and anyone to help them make a difference and positively change the world. Earlier this year, Mark received, very much deserved, an OBE for his services to animal welfare. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I did drag myself from Brighton, and, and, uh, and it was well worth it to see this amazing room of incredible people. On the way up, I was putting finishing touches to two speeches. One was tonight, 
and one was a best man speech that I'm giving next week, and I just had to make doubly check, make sure that I was giving the right speech tonight, because this could have been a very different evening. Um, I want to say thank you, obviously, to Andrew, where is he, there he is, um, for inviting me along tonight. Huge congratulations on this new book. I didn't realise how big it was, and I, I can't wait to sort of get stuck into it. Um, also, an honour to share the stage with some of my very favourite favourite people, um, esteemed fellow speakers, and obviously everyone in the room tonight who is contributing to making the world a better place for, for animals, which is what it's all about. Um, we're all aware, I'm sure, of the Mahatma Gandhi quote uh, when he acutely observed that the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated, which is one of the best quotes ever. Um, on face value, this makes total sense. Of course it does, especially to everyone here. Um, but digging a little deeper, there's an extra more subtle uh, interpretation of, of this famous quote, which is a, it's a metaphor for how the most vulnerable, in this case animals, are looked after and indeed protected. Um, and I think to seek to reduce the suffering of those sentient beings who are completely under one's domination, maybe under a country's domination, be they vulnerable animals, disabled children, elderly, or indeed any of us, um, often usually unable to fight back, is of course truly a mark of a civilised society, and indeed a government. So that the, the Gandhi quote really, on the surface, is about animals, but deep down, actually not that deep, it's about all of us. Um, so, charting the progress of animal welfare legislation around the world can be an all too clear indication uh, of moral progress uh, of, of nations, uh, as well as displaying, of course, um, the three main values which Peter's already alluded to, empathy, kindness, and of course, compassion. Now, by far one of the most extraordinary, powerful, and indeed simple phrases I've ever heard coined in recent years was from our master of ceremonies, Mr. Peter Egan. And it's one of my, for me, it's one of my favorite things, and it makes me think every single day, and it's called selective compassion, right? Selective compassion, these two words, which really, really describe a type of hypocrisy, often fueled by maybe aesthetics, maybe anthropomorphism, sometimes usually both. So for example, the ability to be absolutely shocked and angered by a lion being shot uh, and, its and its head and its coat being used as a trophy whilst tucking into a yummy roast dinner of factory farmed mm -hmm. pork or beef. Now, we're, we're all aware of that type of hip hypocrisy. Um, in a way, I'm being hypocritical because I'm wearing the old leather shoes and old leather belt. But I think we're all on our, our own personal journeys and I think if we all establish our own boundaries, we can all say, right, from now on, we're not going to contribute or be complicit in terms of any animal abuse or exploitation. So, for example, while I think about it every day, is because on the news you'll see animal feed, you know, or I get an email saying, would you promote this um, pet food, which is made of beetles? And I'm thinking, okay, so you're using sort of boring black beetles to make insect food because you probably wouldn't use butterflies, right? You'd probably get a bit of a bit of a, a abuse for that. Uh, eating boring brown chickens rather than a cute waddling penguin. You know where this is going. Uh, and it's not just in our Western society. Um, when I visited China, um, I visited the Animals Asia Sanctuary run by another phenomenal campaigner, I think we'll all agree, Joe Robinson, uh, who runs Animals Asia. Um, and when you go to the sanctuary, it's incredible, but they, they battle so hard to provide an environment for these bears to, to be, enjoy um, sort of uh, enrichment and to normal behavior after they've been rehabilitated from the bear bar trade. But just a stone's throw from the Animals Asia Sanctuary is the giant panda visitor center, which is obviously um, incredibly popular. The giant panda is the national animal of China. And again, it's a selective compassion because there's one type of bear over there, which mm. would obviously draw so much shame and, and attention to the China's bear bar trade, which is disgusting. Or there's another bear, mm. which is a lot cuter. They have a nursery, there's queues to get in, they're sort of 24 mm. seven, but they're both bears. Mm. So, I think it's, it, it's an interesting thing that, that I think about a lot. Um, closer to home, I want to tell you about um, a notable example of selective compassion I, I, I witnessed in Westminster. And this was at a parliamentary reception to end the dog meat trade in Southeast Asia. And when I, when I go to these events, and I do get invited to lots now as a campaigner, as a vet, whatever hat I'm wearing, and I'm very privileged to, to be in that position, 
But over the years as a campaigner, I'm, I'm so sharp on, on checking out the room, on, on how, uh, how sort of good they're being, or the, the value of, of what their contribution is as, a, as campaigners. Um, so I'm kind of looking out for, for their brand, really, their brand values. And, and the brand values, of course, include every single detail associated with how that campaign is perceived and then hopefully supported, how effective it is, its personality, how it engages, how it forms a relationship with the end user. So scanning the room, and this was one of the rooms on the, on the House of Commons terrace, I always look at the food, always look at the food. It's mm. the biggest key to the integrity, if you like, of a campaign. Now this is... Um, this is a, a parliament which represents obviously a group of countries, a group of nations. So scanning the room, I'm looking at the food and more precisely that there's a lot of sandwiches around which is not uncommon at a parliamentary reception in Westminster and I've arranged events at, at the House of Commons and you're always, always given a choice of what you'd like served. Meat, fish, veggie, even vegan now, they're, they're, they're on it. Mm. Uh, even the wines, you can choose vegan wines. So you all know this, where this is going. But this particular reception, which is again, it's campaigning against the dog meat trade, of Southeast Asia, uh, by a part in a parliament building which represents a group of nations, uh, British, uh, UK, um, to basically tell another group of nations not to eat one type of meat. So you've got piles of sandwiches, which are tuna and the chicken and the beef, mm. and you're thinking, can you not get the basics right? So I, I, I have to call people out. I mean, it's the same as I went to a horse charity. I'm not going to mention who they are. But I went to a horse charity um, event once in London. And they were, again, they were, they were claiming that they're a huge animal welfare organisation and they're serving canapes of tuna and, and chicken and, and all different animals. The silent auction first prize at a charity... To be careful what I say because I don't want to land them in it, but they basically focus on exploitation of equines. Um, the first prize in the silent auction was a uh, day out for four people at Ascot race. Oh <laughs> and when the, when the guy came round, because they were, they were thinking about asking me to be an ambassador or patron or whatever, and I obviously declined, and I gave my reasons. I said, first, we can't claim to be an animal welfare charity and to serve other animals. Secondly, <laughs> secondly offering, a f uh, offering a day out for Ascot for four people horse racing, I said, what, what, what's that about? And they said, well, it's what our supporters expect. And there's so many opportunities for people to display their core values, their brand values, and, and literally walk the walk and talk the talk. The Animal Welfare Awards in, in Birmingham, which I've attended, serve meat. Every horse is meat. Why? It's what people expect. And, and it's all these opportunities being missed to educate, to raise awareness, and to show what you believe in. Um, anyway, so... This was, this was the, the reception and, and, and selective compassion at its finest and pretty much most ugliest. And how utterly depressing and, and, and how it challenges the integrity of that campaign's brand and reputation. I did pull them up on it and they were like, oh yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I'm almost finished. Some of the recent progress made in, in UK legislation, um, Lucy's Law has been mentioned to ban puppy and kitten dealers and make all breeders accountable. Finn's Law, legally protecting service animals like police dogs against abuse were well, not only hugely popular with the British public, and thankfully, because we had so many petitions and MPs um, written to, but there were huge wins also enjoyed by parliamentarians. And this is really important, because it makes parliamentarians look like they care, mm -hmm. look like empathetic, look like they're kind, look like they're compassionate. And for whatever reason, a parliamentarian, be it an MP backbencher or a minister, backs your campaign if we don't care about their motives. If they want to make them look good, fine, just back it. But it makes them look good, it makes them look like they care, and it makes them look like they're prioritising the most vulnerable, i.e. us. And that's a really important message for, for us as a, an electorate, as the people who are going to be voting them in or out at the next general election. So I think my point is, the best hope for further progress lies in exposing and calling out exploitation and abuse of the most vulnerable, making animal welfare become, just like human rights, an international issue that affects countries' reputations, the brand of a country's reputation, um, if you like. And it's up to all of us to keep reminding politicians and governments of this, of this easy, low-hanging fruit, one of my favourite expressions once I've started campaigning, low-hanging fruit. 
you know, banning the import of fur, foie gras, banning cages for laying hens, hunting trophies, banning <coughs> live cattle and sheep exports, banning greyhound racing, banning, banning puppy smuggling. A lot of these, obviously, including the primates as pets, are in the Kept Animals Bill, which as most of us know has been stalled in Westminster. Um, and of course, animals being used in experiments, like the unknown beagle here. Mm -hmm. um, and I think keep, if, you, if you keep the pressure on parliamentarians, decision makers, to keep passing laws to protect the most vulnerable, um, then, as a quote from uh, Gladiator, they will love you for it. They will love you for it. And I think we need to keep reminding politicians, mm -hmm. decision makers, lawmakers, that this works for them, not just for the animal. This works mm -hmm. for them. Um, and I think that's a really strong message to send, especially with general elections coming up. If you look after animals, you're looking after us, and we will back you, we will believe in you, and we will vote for you. And I think going forward, it's, it's, it's worth remembering some of that stuff. So thanks again, everyone, for listening. Have a lovely evening. Good luck with the book, and I appreciate you inviting me along to speak. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Mm -hmm. Very clear that it's a huge subject. That's why this book is so absolutely necessary. Um, I mean, in terms of the old shoes, Mark, um, when I, when, when I uh, decided to give up eating meat, um, I was talking to my wife about it in front of one of my seven dogs about 15 years ago. And uh, that very evening, this one dog, Titus, um, found some of my leather shoes and started to chew them. <laughs> so that set me on the right path. And I found, I found Will's vegan and eco vegan. Uh, Will's vegan shoes. Most <laughs> 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 comfortable shoes I've ever worn, and of course, um, eco vegan belt. So, they are my so um, now I'm going to invite, before I knock this over, I'm going to invite all of our speakers up onto the stage. Um, if you have any questions, that would be wonderful, and I will. You can ask them through me. I'll pass them on, or you can ask them directly to any of our wonderful speakers. Um, thank you all for coming this evening. We've got about 15 minutes of questions, so if you wouldn't mind um, asking them as quickly as you can, we'll see if we can get them answered. At the back, gentlemen. Uh, yeah, um, hi guys. Uh, thank you for producing the book. That's going to be super helpful in studying. Um, when it comes to climate activism especially, um, I was actually uh, at a meeting today where we were discussing like a, youth, uh, a climate assembly in, in Winchester. And uh, one of the things that came up was obviously what we're going to serve people at this climate assembly, and it's not a you know an animal centric thing. And we said, well, obviously we'll have uh, you know some sandwiches and you know um, teas and coffees. I said, oh yeah, obviously plant based sandwiches and alternative milks. Oh, well that might not be good with the participants. Might... How do you overcome that sort of immediate hit back of we need to have this kind of move towards uh, climate agenda, but obviously then not talking about the you know the calendar really. Well, my philosophy is if people want to eat meat, that's fine. Um, I'm happy to serve them meat. We have friends around for dinner. I always say to them, you know, do you want us to cook your meat? And we will, and we do uh, occasionally. But most of them will say, no, I'll, I'll eat the vegetarian food you're going to eat. Um, and so in a situation like that, I would actually make meat available and if people want to eat it, that's up to them. Anyone else like to comment on that? So I'd probably turn the situation and almost repackage it as into an opportunity to educate and explain why. And I think once you've done that, it's very hard for people to, to be critical of that. I think every communication along those lines just has to be positive and justified. And if you say we're doing this because of this and then people will you know, experience vegan food maybe, or, or then I think you're, you're turning it into a positive experience for the end user. I think as soon as you go, we're gonna do this or just deal with it, or this is how it is, you put people's backs up. But I think as, as long as everything's carefully explained, justified, and maybe even take them out for a vegan meal to sort of get it, um, I, I just think progress can be made. I, I do get your point though, by the way. But I just think, especially with climate change, that has, has to be the way forward. It's always so. good, isn't it? it? Clearly, it's always good to have the conversation, basically. Mm -hmm. And we know that we're not gonna turn the world vegan 
in my lifetime, certainly. But we can keep the conversation going. And the conversation is happening more and more uh, as we go along. And I think it's a great point to make. And uh, the next question. Yes, no, 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 no. I've got a question for Andrew. Could you please speak up? I have a question for Andrew. Yeah. So when the Queen dissolves Parliament, as I'm sure she will, with this debacle that's going on at the moment, what is your first act going to be as Prime Minister? <laughs> <laughs> and is, is it going to be a problem being a, born in Australia, being Prime Minister of the UK? <laughs> Right. Uh, thank you for that question. Did everyone hear that? Well, all right. Yes. Uh, first act is prime minister. Uh, I, can I? Is, can this be like one of our Winchester um, project assessments where we have all these different elements that are included within a single project? Uh, there's so many things I'd love to do. You know, uh, crikey. Um, I guess I would obviously want to put animal welfare on the curriculum uh, throughout uh, the schools and universities where it doesn't already exist of the nation because it has benefits not just for animals, which are very much part of our societies, although we often do tend to forget that, but they're the most neglected parts of our societies, but also because this benefits people uh, and the environment in so many ways as well. We have a chapter in this book all about the links between uh, human health and animal welfare uh, and the uh, one welfare uh, issue um, and also we have a chapter about uh, human wildlife conflict, uh, climate change, biodiversity loss, uh, going into some detail about the adverse impacts unfortunately caused to uh, the environment and to the climate by uh, increasing intensification expansion, expansion of animal farming actually. So um, there are benefits to the environment, the ecosystem we all depend upon uh, for uh, human uh, beings and, and their health and well-being and of course for animals which are very much part of our society so it would have to go on the uh, national curriculum. Look there are many other things I would certainly do a as well um, and I uh, will um, defer to my other speakers uh, because of lack of time but I can't because the question was directed to me. Would anyone else <laughs> like, to, like to, to add anything to that they'd like to see on the national, well, the changes? Just to say I've got a meeting in Westminster about getting animal welfare on the national curriculum in September. Oh. Fantastic, well done. As, as Peter mentioned in my intro, I do loads of school visits every two weeks to schools in Brighton and around Brighton for different, yeah, different ages and post-pandemic I've changed the school visit to caring about animals to uh, from caring about animals to caring about animals and caring for each other so it's spotting signs that animals are ill and now it's spotting signs that your family members are ill or your friends are ill or your teachers ill and it's a really nice sort of holistic approach so it's pets wildlife um and, and we do touch on euthanasia and, and brachycephalic um, breed problems as well depending on their age but actually to go from caring for animals and caring for each other and just basing the whole thing on empathy compassion and kindness it kind of brings it all together um, and it's, it's just such a natural link that I never spotted before the pandemic weirdly. So yeah, the, there is progress being made in Westminster and I'll keep you updated. Right, that's wonderful. And we have Ruth Devere here who's our education author who is the expert in this area and had just did an absolutely fantastic chapter and a brilliant presentation at our last conference on this so thank you Ruth and anyone who wants to discuss later in the mark, it's that. Lovely. Oops, I'm just going to dance with this. Uh. I have a question about um, animal law uh, in the UK, because there are very few cases that I'm aware of in terms of animal cruelty, which is a baseline almost. Of course, we have had a bit of um, um, attention. Uh, I was wondering, it's a dual question, I was wondering if you see this as making any practical difference, really, beyond the headlines and beyond doctors and restaurants. Um, and also the second one is, um, I don't know if you're aware of, but there was a case, a case of uh, recognizing elephant paintings, uh, the case of Lucy in the Bronx Zoo in New York, and it's a very happy, because Lucy is in Edmonton Zoo, um, happy in the Bronx where um, a legal team, a non-human rights project, brought the case to recognize that she's an autonomous being and has the right to basic freedoms. I was wondering if you see uh, future um, of similar cases being brought into the UK? Um. Difficult question. Um, in relation to the first part of the question, the sentience 
act as it now is does have the potential to have a practical impact because not only does it recognise that animals are sentient, which is of symbolic importance but not practical importance, but it creates a committee that should inform policy making in the future. How well that does its job is going to be judged further down the line. It has the potential and it's really good and that signalling that Mark talked about in Parliament is really good. We had um, it was introduced by Lord Benyon as something that we should be proud of, that we should, as a nation, be proud of animal welfare, and so that's, that's very good signalling. Um, but we'll have to see how the committee performs. In relation to the personhood cases, on a practical level, I would say the chances of success here are not so good. And we've seen in America those cases so far have not succeeded in the courts. But there is more traction in some Latin American countries, um, and so that's really good to see. It's a legal case rather than a philosophical case. I think many of us here would want to see um, the moral criteria for protection being sentience, uh, being the capacity to suffer, whereas those cases are around autonomy for those beings who have that additional cognitive capacity. So it's limited in terms of what it can achieve, but of course one sees the um, potential further down the line culturally of the implications of those type of cases. So that, that's where I stand on those issues. They are covered by the books as well. We have um, Matthew Liebman did a brilliant um, piece about the American, um, the, the American litigation. It is important litigation. And our friends at the Non-Human Rights Project, we, we've been in contact with them over the years, and they're doing fantastic work, and we support what they're doing. Oh, maybe incidental that I could just share an anecdote with you. Um, I had occasion recently to have, um, thank you, uh, to have dinner at the House, House of Lords, and um, when the waiter came, there was an overwhelming smell of fish in the room. It was very hot, no air conditioning, and I, I, I felt poisoned. And um, I said to the waiter, uh, do you have any vegan options? And he said, um, give me a moment, sir. So he went away and came back uh, and he said, yes, the chef can, can provide you with something. I said, oh, so what have you got for a starter? He said, uh, asparagus, sir. I said, oh, that's lovely, thank you, I'll have asparagus. Um, I, I, and the main course, he said, um, Asparagus and chips. <laughs> <laughs> when, it, when it comes to uh, 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 the, the, the houses that control our laws in the country, I don't have too much hope as far as sentience is concerned at the moment. Anyway, next question. If we have a next question. We have to close down quite soon, so if you've got one, could we have it? There we are. Um, what was your proudest moment in the book, and what are you scared of going forward, or what are you worried about? Anyone in particular? Uh, all three. All, all three. three. I mean, what can be the not existent in the book? I'm going to say the um, proudest moment, I think, is probably just reading through the bios of all of our um, chapter authors that are included in the book. As one of our reviewers said, you have a stellar international um, cast of uh, animal welfare scientists, animal advocates. Uh, mm. Uh, lawyers and scholars uh, in this field. So I'm amazed that we've managed to assemble together such a collection of 50 of these people in the world to produce this this um, volume. I'm very proud indeed of, of that. The thing I'm most concerned about going forward is the prospect that after going through all this effort and succeeding, hopefully very well, Unfortunately, there is a chance that Routledge may ask us to do the whole thing again for a second edition. <laughs> <laughs> I need some time off on Mark's speech. Uh, well, prior to that. I'd say exactly the same, and only add that just, just being asked was, you know, that was a very proud moment for me. Thank you again. Oh. I, I think, as with any book, the proudest moment really is when you can put the pen down, it's all over, it's finished. Mm. It was a long gestation. Andrew was fantastic in steering us down the path um, across the airwaves, but uh, did a great job. And uh, um, yeah, a rather different uh, uh, way of leading the editing 
to what I'm used to because it was all electronic. We had to upload this, that, and the other. And sometimes I nearly gave up, but I, I stuck at it and controlled it. <laughs> we, we got there. Yeah, but thank you, Andrew. You did a you did a great job. And yes, proud at the end of it because we had got a, a good product. I think. Fantastic. Any more questions? That's it. Okay. Well, um, I just like to thank. Before we end, I've just got a small something I would like to. Actually, Rishi Sunak. <laughs> I'd actually like to give you, Peter, and my other colleagues on the stage here. So I'm just going to get that. <laughs> we can't possibly do an event like this without lots and lots of celebrating and I'd really like to help my uh, colleagues and uh, Mark who's done such a wonderful job with our NC to uh, celebrate and to thank them for their incredible contributions to this book and for speaking uh, through tonight and for helping us out Mark so uh, thank you very much indeed uh, to everyone <laughs> No idea what she's about to do. Oh, by yeah. the way. <laughs> you always think about other people first, and you don't think about yourself. And that's what oh, I love you so much because you are fantastic at bringing people together and bringing about major change. And I'm so proud of you, and I want to thank you as well. So there you go. No flowers, but. <laughs> wife, Yasmin, is the person who's probably suffered most um, uh, because of uh, this book. All of our friends and families largely lost us for 2021 during this project. Um, and uh, in my case, Yasmin, I think, made the biggest sacrifices. So thank you very much for tolerating uh, the ridiculous long hours and lost weekends uh, working on, on this book. Thank you so much. Bless you. A big round of applause for all our contributors. <laughs> and also a big round of applause for all of you too. <laughs> Please uh, do stay, uh, enjoy the refreshments, uh, chat to us more outside in the room out there. Whatever you do, please do take those photographs if you think there's any good ones, send them through because otherwise they're not going to happen. Thanks so much everyone. <laughs>